And now it is our great pleasure to introduce to you two people who are real fighters, not only in what they are doing, but also in what they are living. On the stage, Pancho Karaminski will talk about his experience of working in IT company, and at the same time, being a DJ who happened to be blind. So although he doesn't have eyesight, he sees with his soul. And his colleague Danica Sabeva comes from Bulgaria, also uh, representing SAP Labs, one of the most important software companies in the world. So she will talk about expectations versus reality and challenges we overcome when we work in IT industry. Please give up the great round of applause to our dear guests who traveled all the way from Sofia to meet you. Zdravo Beograd, kako ste? After the lunch. Okay. My name is Denica Sabeva and this is Pancho Karamanski. We are from Bulgaria and we are extremely happy to be here with you on the Innovation Summit 2017. Our topic for today is expectations and reality. But before going deeper into it, let me ask you something. How many of you, please raise your hand, how many of you failed to accomplish their child's dream? How many of you didn't become what you have expected to become when you're younger? Okay. Me neither. When I was a little girl, my only dream was to become an artist. I wanted it so badly that, you know, I've always admired those free-minded guys with fancy hats, having all the free time in the world to create masterpieces. And I couldn't even miss an opportunity to practice my skills. One day, I remember at the age of four or five years old, I found my mom's passport. At that time in Bulgaria, we had those green big passports with many, many pages. So I knew that it's an important document. I decided I'm going to draw there. In fact, I drew in every single page of that passport, most focusing on my mom's photo, where I added some really fancy accessories like big earrings and even a crown. As you can imagine, my mom wasn't happy about the result. And instead of encouraging me, she just ran out to the nearest police station trying to convince the officers there that her daughter was expressing her feelings in a very creative way. Many years, many years passed since that moment and I'm not an artist today. But the important thing, you know, the important thing is that children under age of seven know exactly what they want to achieve in life because they're not interested neither in money nor in social status, corporations, anything. They just know what to do with their life. We can say that children have certain expectations about themselves. But what are the expectations? We use this word a lot in our day life. I expect this to happen, or I expect that to happen. But do we know what's an expectation? Well, according to the usresearch.com, an expectation is the belief of something to happen or be in the case. And expectations may have different sources. They come from everywhere. They come from family, friends, society, schools, university, but they come from you also. The important thing you should remember about expectations is not the way they're coming from. The important part is expectations change us. And they can change us in three different ways. It's really interesting. Can I go back? This one, yeah. So expectation changes in three different ways. First, they change us physically. Uh, imagine this situation. You're about to take an exam, and it's a really important exam. But you, have, you feel somehow that you're not good prepared about it. So you have a certain expectations about yourself that you're going to fail. And these expectations 
change your whole body. For example, sometime, some kind of hormones like cortisol are rising and you're feeling stressed because of your expectations. So expectations can change us also socially. If we say we have a certain expectation about your future partner, wife or husband, you imagine him or her of any type. And because of your expectations, you go to certain places and do certain activities like, for example, well, in order to meet her or him, you go to uh, fitness halls, um, what else, bars, pubs, conferences like this, I don't know. <laughs> in order to meet her or him, and this change your social life. But expectations can also change us psychologically. Let's say you have certain expectations that you have to have a child under age of 35 or be married under 35. And this is a common expectation. I think most of the grandparents parents, uh, have these expectations about you as well. So if you have this expectation, it's okay in your late 20s. I mean, you're not thinking about it so much. But when you get closer to 35 or even above 35, well, things are getting much different. This, this fact that you are still not married or still not having that child makes you change in a psychological way. So expectations change us. And if expectations change us, they can form the reality around us. I mean, what happens? Oh, okay, so expectations form the reality. And here I want to mention an experiment. Most of you have already heard about it. But for those of you, I'll briefly explain. Who, for those of you who haven't heard of it, I'll briefly explain. So we have a jar and fleece. We all know about fleece, right? Who knows? Who have seen a flea? Good. So fleas are amazing creatures. They're like that tiny little bugs, but they are great jumpers. They jump really high comparing to their size. So we have a group of scientists that put these fleas in the jar and they put a lid over that jar in order to keep the fleas in the jar. And as you can imagine, the fleas wanted to escape. So they hit the lid and produced this sound. Many fleas were trying to escape. Well, a, a couple of days later, the scientists came back. And this time, the sound from that jar was only a few adventurous and bravest fleas this time were trying to escape. What about the others? The others somehow learned to fly just over the limitation of that jar in order to keep them safe. And it's an amazing fact. Because after another week, the scientists came back, and this time the sound from that jar was nothing. Not a single flea this time wanted to escape from the jar. And when we removed the lid from that jar, the results stayed the same. Somehow the fleas weren't to fly just over the limitation of the jar to keep them safe. Amazing. Because if we remove the, the lid from that situation, if we remove even the jar from that situation, I don't know why. If we remove the jar from that situation, the, the results stay the same. And even the new reproduced offspring of these fleas, which haven't faced the boundaries of the jar, have the expectations that they would hurt themselves if they jump higher. So they didn't. It's amazing. Because, because of the expectation, expectations of the fleas, they form the whole reality. By the way, it's a different reality from our point of view because we observe different situation. Here on the second picture, you've seen that fleas have the opportunity to go outside. So we have the different realities. And if we have two different realities, then there's no such term as one reality. So reality is not something that is one. There are many realities. Can we go back? Uh, 
One more. No. Okay, so, as I said, reality is fake. And you've seen a lot of my slides, so. <laughs> but you don't know what I'm going to say. So, in order to prove that reality is fake, because it sounds really serious, let's forget about fleas and talk about humans. Let's talk about people. Let's talk about even you. Imagine you're staying at home, and it's like a very hot, summer day in the middle of June or August or it doesn't matter, but it's really hot. And you feel you're going to go for a walk. You go outside and you go to the nearest park. After 30 or 40 minutes, you decide that you want to drink water because you get thirsty. And after that, after going so much, you, you see these beautiful fountains. This one, this one. So you've seen it and you get closer to them in order to drink from that water. And it doesn't matter which one, you just drink from that water. At this point, you're feeling so grateful and so happy that some of the guys has built these fountains in a way that you and other people like you are able to drink, right? But this is your reality, just your reality. Now imagine the same hot day in the middle of June. But this time it's not you. This time is the neighbor next to you. He's living in the next apartment. And this neighbor is in a wheeling chair. This neighbor, again, wants to go for a walk in this hot day. And he gets outside. Somehow he reaches the nearest park, just like you. And after 30, 40, 50 minutes, he again gets thirsty. All of a sudden, he sees these fountains, and he's so happy that he wants to drink from them. And he gets closer, just like you, just like you. But unfortunately, he sees he's not able to drink. Why? Do you know why? Because the guys who has built these fountains build it in a way that they are not accessible and usable by people in wheeling chairs. And. It's really pity because, you know, I have like 10 years of experience in the software industry and I've seen a lot of such examples of products that are designed in a way that are not accessible or usable by people with disabilities. And forget about software industry. We've seen these examples of, well, this is just infrastructure. We've seen it and we've never asked ourselves, can other people People use this. I wish we have built things in a way that are accessible and usable, not only by us, but by all other peoples. So examples like this, like this, wouldn't be so rarely met. This fountain, by the way, is in the right size and shape, so everyone even people with disabilities, and especially by people in willing chairs. So, what can I say? If we build things just like that, it would be nicer, right? Because here, not only your, your neighbor would use this fountain, but also, as you can see, white nature or your pet. It's really an example of a fully accessible product, something that you can build just to, to change your perspective. And we are living in an enormous universe. And we are like that tiny little, just like the fleas. And we are so many and have so many different expectations. These expectations would change our reality. Even today, we have uh, this conference and we are sharing the same experience today. But we won't have the same reality because we have different expectations. So if you have the chance, like it was said in the previous session, to change the world, to design things, to prepare products, always think of them, of something that it's not, it won't be usable only by you or the group 
in which you belong, but it would be usable by all people. So if you have this opportunity, be the child under seven years old, keeping your own expectations, and don't follow the other fleas around. Always challenge their expectations. Uh, now I want to introduce someone, very special person to me, uh, somebody who, although doesn't see, have some really good ideas about life. So, Pancho Karamanski. Thank you. Okay, it's a good sounding here. Where is the table? There, is a, there was a table here. I need assistance to, to find the table. It's be what? It's behind me. Okay, it's cool. Yeah, okay. Okay, I can. Okay, I love it. Somebody call me on the phone. Okay, I'll call you later. I love this table. Uh, the clicker, I'm not sure that I want to use that. I'll uh, ask for help with this also because the, there's uh, always a fight between the speaker and the clicker and the sounds around me. I'm pretty annoyed by that sometimes because all my world is sound. Uh, what I want to talk about is I'm very, very excited being here because one of my first mentors in my life was born here in Serbia and he gave me a very important lesson. He told me when I was around 14, dude, be enough skill, be enough skill and you never look for a job. And that's what, that's what I did in my life. Uh, maybe the first slide, if you can play it. Is that okay? I'm doing it. Okay, this is a bird. What, what these birds uh, show to me and, and to us, <clears throat> this is the logo of my foundation, which I started with my sister and with other young people with visual disabilities in order to help active visual impaired people to achieve more and to realize their dreams. And why we do it? Because we found that in Bulgaria there are 8,000 uh, blind people in working age and just 300 of them has a job. And we discovered that the people just need um, proper education and adapted trainings in soft skills and other shof, um, uh, social skills. Yeah, that was the word. And th the only problem which we have is that the blind people doesn't know this need. And we will figure out how to, to do that. But um, I would mention that the second slide is a picture of me and my sister when I started dealing with the reality and expectations of other people, actually. That was, I'm on, here, I'm on 10 years old when I lost my vision. And uh, my father and my parents and my teachers become have uh, expectations about my life. And my father proposed me to reconstruct uh, one of the rooms in our house to, in, to make a workshop for me, where I can make uh, um, baskets and ropes just for a living. I don't know if this comes from society, for, but he decided to propose me. I said no, because I dreamed to become a DJ and songwriter and music producer and a lot of things after that. But... Five minutes, thank you, I need 12. <laughs> I will keep it short. Um, after, uh, after that, at the school, I wasn't good at all. The only way my teachers knows to tackling with guys like me was to repeat that I'm too lazy to achieve anything in my life. I wasn't lazy. I, I wasn't interested in what they want to, to tell me, what they want to, to teach me. And reality today, after this kind of expectations, because I have to be short, reality is, if it's the next slide, is okay? Okay, the reality is that I'm working and learning from the Grammy producer, Eel Factor from the United States, who was a mentor of mine for several months, and who works, uh, who works with the artists like uh, Calvin Harris, uh, Sia, if you know this girl, Justin Timberlake and Timbaland, who was a mentor of mine. And just two months ago, my first re original remix was worldwide released. Oh, it's a nice sound, I like it. Uh, worldwide released and promoted one of 
uh, from one of the biggest music agency in the world. It calls uh, WMA, and that was uh, possible. That was possible because I found my personal reality changers, and I want to share with you. The first one which changed my reality, and I recommend it to you, is to know your personal values. Those things who makes you who you are on this planet. I'm lucky enough to know them. Let me share with you the first, my personal five, let's say. This is the honesty, uh, the freedom, fun, contribution, and learning. Those five things which I'm looking for anytime when I'm starting something. The second reality changer is to find a cause to serve. My cause is to help other visually impaired people to, to achieve more. Because I received a lot of help in my, in my life. I've, I, countless people, thousands of people helped me. And the fourth one is the most difficult, believe me. To learn how to respect the other people's dreams and beliefs. That was more difficult for me. Okay. And now I'll give you the bonus one. The fourth one is... Um, spending time with learning new things and developing new skills also can be a reality changer. Two years ago, just two years ago, I was on a walk with a friend of mine, and after that I decided to take a bus, which I've never taken before. On the bus station, one young lady approached me and started very kindly conversation with me about my um, experience as a blind person with the computers, let's say. No, it was per with the computers. And uh, are you able, actually, to guess who this young, this young lady was? Yeah, it was Denitza. It was Denitza, this girl, which you've seen before. And we take the bus in the same direction, actually, and uh, we continue conversation when I understood that she works for SAP, and uh, I believe with uh, her help, four months later, I was invited to an interview. Um, I've never expected that because I dedicated my life in music. And after the interview, shortly, I started working for SAP as an accessibility tester, the guy who checked if the software is enough accessible for visually impaired person. And I learned something there in a corporate environment. Um, and that was the feedback is the most valuable gift in the business world, having a feedback, honest feedback. And I recognized something very mind uh, about my personal life because I have to ask for feedback triple more about my clothing, about my hair, about my anything I have to ask for feedback. And by the way, asking for feedback is another good way to manage expectations in my case. And mentioning expectations, I want to share with you just a last short story. Two months ago, I decided to go uh, and to visit uh, the biggest music event here in Europe for aspiring producers like me, for people who want to make a music and want to break through in the music industry. And that was a dance fair in the city of Utrecht in Netherlands. And I was with my best friend. Let me show them. my best friend. Uh, here it is. This is my best friend. Always helps me. And we together went to the Utrecht when I visited more than, 50, uh, more than 10 uh, master classes. I met one of the, my favorite DJs anyway from the world. It's called Laid Back Look. And I touched this guy personally. I was very impressed by that. And I expected to have more problems uh, with finding the rooms for master classes, but people were very, very helpful in the building. There was more than 15 classrooms. Okay, somebody, somebody tried to call me again. And I didn't expect but the next one, next picture. What you see on the next picture? Would you tell me, please? Yeah, a lot of bikes. Then maybe, maybe they look pretty normal for, in your reality. 
in a city like Utrecht to have a lot of bikes. But in my reality, that was very, very painful and dangerous for me. And just to, to close this session, I would like to form one sentence, just one sentence. The reality is not something granted for me. The reality is a result of our dreams, our motivation, and our actions. Thank you guys, and we would love to answer your questions after the session and when you decided to come to ask me something. Thank you. How are you doing? Now we will be talking about innovation cities, the incubators for innovation. So we brought some amazing people from two continents, from Israel, Tel Aviv, Hila Oren and Sharon Landis Fisher will join forces and talk about how is it to create companies and to have access to brilliant people. From Silicon Valley, Tukce Erhul, who actually has some Balkan roots, will share her insights. And the social impact side from Norbert Kunz, who just arrived from Berlin. Please give a amazing applause to our panelists. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Milena, and thank you very much for having us here uh, in Belgrade. This is the first time for us, at least, so hello, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about cities as innovation hubs, people, and funds to invest in. Let me introduce the distinguished panel. Near me is Norbert Kunz. Norbert is one of the highest profile social entrepreneurs in Germany. For more than 20 years, he has been advising and supporting founders of new businesses and has actively brought forward the development of social innovations as co-founder of several organizations. In his role as CEO of the nonprofit business Social Impact GmbH, he is focusing on the development of an infrastructure of social innovation and on the support of social startups. He intended the foundation, sorry, he initiated the foundation of the first social impact lab in Berlin in 2011 and the launch of the first business incubation program for social startups in Germany. Today, there are numerous labs and incubation programs all over Germany. Hello, Norbert. Tuche Ergo. Turcia is a co-founder of Angel Labs, a global investor accelerator based in Silicon Valley. With a presence in more than 40 countries, Angel Labs is the world's first investor accelerator with a focus on super-changing investor ecosystems all around the world and building connected and educated investor groups. Angel Labs' goal is to make an impact on the liquidity side of the entrepreneurial equation, democratize venture capital, and create smart capital for entrepreneurs. Toche has been, sorry, has been and continues to be a national and international consultant and speaker for economic development, angel and venture financing for numerous countries and NGOs, including the EU and the OECD. Toche has worked closely with several countries on their national entrepreneurship programs, including Malaysia, South Korea, Mexico, Vietnam, Turkey, and Argentina. Turcia received her undergraduate degree in finance from Sorbonne University with honors and holds a master's degree in international management at, uh, from Bocconi. And now I'd like you to meet my colleague uh, from Tel Aviv, Ms. Hila Oren. So Hila is the CEO of the Tel Aviv Foundation in Israel. Hila aims to, identif to identify and support public-private partnerships aligned with the vision of the mayor and the municipality. She's a passionate 
about innovation practices and programs that fuel urban development and positively impact the lives of citizens. She previously founded and served as the CEO of Tel Aviv Global, a city-owned company affiliated with the Tel Aviv municipality dedicated to elevating the city's global positioning. During her term, the startup city vision was formed, a municipal strategic plan for investors, entrepreneurs, tourists, and students connecting a city platform with private initiative. Hilad defines herself as a city maker and is focused on innovative financial tools. She's currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at Haifa University and holds a BA and a master's degree in business administration from Tel Aviv University with a connection, sorry, with a concentration in uh, entrepreneurship. She also completed a program at the Harvard Kennedy Business School. So hello to all my panelists. And uh, it's very nice uh, to have you here. We would like to have, um, for the first round, each of you uh, describe the major issues of your activity and what is it exactly that you do. And then after the audience will learn about that, we'll dip into some further questions. So Newbert, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much for your invita <laughs> for the invitation. It's very, I'm very happy to be here. Um, because there's a great audience, very young people, and to influence young people to do the right thing, it's great. So, uh, uh, Social Impact is an agency uh, agency for social innovation. We create social innovation then more than almost 30 years. We started in the end of the 80s, uh, and we had we actually we have two focuses. One focus is inclusive entrepreneurship. That means we support people. Uh, who have no chances on the on the employment market uh, to make their own business, and the other focus is to develop social innovations. Uh, we do this in a specific kind. We have created social business incubators. So we call it social impact labs, and we offer people who have an idea to change the world for a better as the option uh, to create their own business or social business. So we do it in a specific manner. That means we offer free co-working space for eight months, uh, business support, mentoring, coaching, different qualification, access to finance. We have developed the biggest social startup crowdfunding platform in Germany. We offer them access to other financial partners and to networks. So it works very, very successful, though, and we are very happy to do this. It's great for us as well. We have, we have learned so much in the last five years about different topics that we will do in the next five years, definitely, or maybe in the next ten years. Thank you. Hila, please describe your work. Uh, before I describe, first of all, Milena, thank you so much for bringing us here and for sitting, as you said before, young audience. And especially, I appreciate the mother that, bring the, that brought the youngest person to listen to us. I really do believe that when we um, start, when we're young as entrepreneurs, we'll be great entrepreneurs. So keep it up. It's really appreciated. I have three kids. And the youngest one is seven years old, so I'm, I'm going to do something when I'm coming back home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, let's go into what I'm, uh, what I'm doing now. I'm the CEO of Tel Aviv Foundation, which is a, a little bit uh, um, traditional foundation, 40 years old, dealing with philanthropy. But we're all urbanists, and I define myself as a city maker. A city maker is someone that um, lives in a city and creates with what there is already there. And what is already there? You guys. You're full of talent, you're full of knowledge. In Tel Aviv, we're packed with people that are great, innovative minds, and we just have to take barriers off and help them um, do what they want and what they feel. Now, this looks and sounds a little bit, um, I don't say, cliche, but if us as clerks sit there and really do that, we can um, influence reality. Now, this is the first stage. The second stage is since we already understand that in cities, in Berlin, in London, in New York, in Tel Aviv, Belgrade is, um, is getting there. Um, at the end of the day, the budget is never enough. So we need to stretch 
city budget. And when we're talking about city budget, we have into um, we go into innovative financial tools such as crowdfunding, such as city coins, such as social bonds, such as things we'll talk a little bit later. Um, but before I move the microphone um, over to my colleague, uh, which will talk probably a little bit about those one specific tool, I want to thank again uh, the guy before me that put another focus. I got, just by being here in the last 30 minutes, I got two focuses. The first one you heard already. The second one is my blind colleague, which are always around us, but again, with a fountain. I was never aware that I can just approach the fountain and drink, and someone on a wheelchair cannot. So these two things, I think, by encouraging the young people not to be afraid of failure and being aware to um, disabilities and making things accessible are two little things that, as innovators, with budget that will make it bigger, is something that a, a city maker is supposed to do. So this is... In very short, what I think I'm doing. Yeah. Trucia, tell us about yourself. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here in Belgrade. Uh, thanks for having me. So, um, what I do in general, I'm going to talk about it, and I think during the panel we're going to focus more about, uh, more on the intersection of what I do and, and city economies. But um, a little bit about Angel Labs. So, I'm a founding partner at Angel Labs, and it is, a, it is an investor accelerator. And what that means is we focus on cultivating new generation investors who invest in talented entrepreneurs around the world. We have um, worked with 44 countries so far and have created 6,000 first-time investors who wrote their first-time checks. So overall, um, and we're pretty good at collecting the data, but I'm sure we're missing some numbers because not every investor we've worked with is that good at like following up with us and filling the surveys we send to them. But as far as we know, we have helped facilitate at least um, $130 million in first-time investments in entrepreneurs in 44 countries through the um, investors we worked with. And, um, and the way we do it is we partner with different stakeholders in ecosystems like local chambers of commerce, banks, uh, wealth management groups, different corporations. We also do corporate venture capital work, but that's, that's a different story. Um, so we partner with all those stakeholders and we bring together all those um, individuals, high net worth individuals and family offices and, um, and educate them on becoming an investor and provide them with the necessary tools and resources so they can actually take action because we think they can learn the best by taking action and not just like going through some training programs or workshops. So um, in a nutshell, that's what we, that's what we focus on. And, and the, the story behind it is before Angel Labs, I was actually with, a, with an investment fund it was, a, it was a Russian fund with a presence in San Francisco, and I was in that team, and our goal was to go around the world uh, and look for talented entrepreneurs and startups in emerging markets. And one of the biggest reasons we could not, that was back in 2012, and we, went, we traveled to 30 countries and made some investments in 11 countries. And the reason we couldn't invest in more places is not because there, there weren't talented entrepreneurs and startups, in, uh, in the remaining countries, but uh, the major issue was we could not find any investors we could co-invest with. So that was the biggest idea and reason behind why we created Angel Labs, because back in 2012, the venture capital ecosystem, the investor ecosystem around the world in those countries, in those cities, it, was, it, it did not exist. So now I think um, there are a lot of similar initiatives and um, there is a big, people are more conscious about the need to create more investors and liquidity for entrepreneurs. So with Angel Labs, that's what we're trying to solve and that's what we do with different city governments and, and that's, uh, that's our work in um, innovative cities to help them foster their investor ecosystems. So how can a city become more attractive to angels, to investors, because entrepreneurs are everywhere, but the money is not everywhere. So how can cities become, compete, and become more and more attractive in the eyes of the angels and the investors in your mind? So it's, it's, I think it's a chicken and egg problem because we see that all around the world there are a lot of places with great entrepreneurs, but they don't have a strong investment ecosystem. 
or they do have a lot of like investors, but they they miss the quality deal flow because maybe the country is too small. Um, there are amazing initiatives around the world, like uh, in Puerto Rico, there's a program called Parallel 18. It's a government-backed initiative. It's a um, they attract they invite entrepreneurs from around the world, but to be able to take part in that, for example, it's not just like free money that the government gives because I think those programs don't work. Um, for a while, there were so many initiatives around the world where you would see a city government or like a, uh, like a federal government give away just grants to entrepreneurs, but that doesn't really work. So now there are like a lot of matching uh, programs where if you raise a certain amount from private investors, then the government matches for you. So it's that kind of a program in Puerto Rico, and they attract a lot of um, foreign entrepreneurs into the program. But what it does is, once there is quality deal flow, it also starts attracting f not only foreign investors, but it also keeps um, it also c helps create local investors. So I think um, you got to do all at the same time. You got to focus on how do I build my local investors? How do I build my local entrepreneurs? But also how do I attract foreign capital and foreign entrepreneurs? So you got to do all at the same time for it to work properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hila, why is Tel Aviv so attractive for investors? What, what's going on there? How many people here have been to Tel Aviv? Okay, okay. From this side is more than from the audience. That means we have a good job to do yeah. about bringing people to Tel Aviv. Um, why is it for investors? First of all, let's talk about people and then let's get into investors because I think we're all people and that's most important. Tel Aviv is a fun city. It's fun to be there. It's a 24-7 city. I can walk at 2 a.m. I, uh, I feel very free when my daughters, 24 and 22, walk at 3 a.m. wherever they feel like. And I know almost, it's not that we don't have crime, we're normal, but, but still it's very safe. So it's a safe city. It's a very tolerant city. Um, we have a great, great community. People feel free. Um, you know, Israel has its conflict issues, but still it's a city where Arabs and Jews and, and Orthodox and all, we all feel very, um, uh, very free among each other. So before anything, it's a great city to live. It's fun, it's nice. We have our beach, we have great weather. Um, we're enjoying ourselves, great food. Who? what is she talking about? Mm. Yes, all those things at the end of the day bring investors because this is where economy flourishes. This is where we have great um, entrepreneurs. We are lucky from some other reasons why our young and youth people are so talented and they learn, they get their skills in their army and we have our, um, I would say, culture that people are, um, it's not that they're not afraid of failure, but it's not as, um, I would say, conservative as sometimes my colleagues from Germany would talk about it, that like, we are, um, uh, I would say, more, um, forgiving. More, more forgiving about uh, um, failures, while in other um, cultures it's not as forgiveness, uh, you don't forgive for a failure. So a failure is something very important for the startup ecosystem because out of each, each 10 startups, all of you guys want to start your startups, right? But unfortunately, only 10% of you will um, succeed. It's not that bad because in the, your second round you will succeed but still, again, with the same percentage. So if we're talking about investors, why do they invest in Tel Aviv? Because of all these components. It's a great city, it's great atmosphere, it's great people, there's talent there. Uh, we share our knowledge. This is not uh, so, I would say, used in all culture to share knowledge, to be transparent with what you, uh, what you achieve. But somehow in our country it is. We have, again, I don't want to um, uh, uh, paint it pink. It's not all good. It's not that we don't have our problems. But this is the advantages that we do have in the city. And then um, uh, the investors come. They follow. In cities, um, we have this sentence there, uh, that we call it, you build and they will follow. Like you build big infrastructure and then people will come. So the same thing with money. We have our... 
um, our great uh, ecosystem. We, we give this great, as city makers, this great um, atmosphere, so people really feel that they want to come and, and, and uh, develop their, their uh, startups there, and then the investors follow. Norbert, please describe uh, the situation in Berlin and in Germany, and I will make it even uh, harder for you. Once you do that, then you explain what you think of Belgrade and what can Belgrade do to uh, attract investors because all these young entrepreneurs would like to be invested in. Uh, so share with us about Berlin and then your recommendation for <laughs> Belgrade. Go for it. Okay, it's a very holistic question. So because we are really focused on social innovation and social startups, but Berlin is a... Uh, startup city in Germany, probably is a startup city in, in, in Europe. We have a lot of startups and there are also a lot of investors around, but I don't care about investors. Uh, so, because if you have a good idea, and even if you work in the social field, if you want to, uh, to change the world for a better, it is not a good idea to look for an investor. Because investors have specific profit interests, and you can change the world for a better if you, if you follow profit interests. That's the first point. So uh, for this reason, we, we don't, share about, uh, don't care about investors. I, I tell you two or three uh, uh, small stories about my life because we have uh, talked about expectations in the beginning, uh, about our expectations, but this audience is very young. So there are a lot of expectations from parents, from grandparents, from friends about your career. And uh, when you have an idea to profit idea or a business idea or to have an idea to do good things in this world, you will ask your friends, your parents, what they think, think about this idea. And if you have a strange idea, they came up with the answer, don't do this, mostly. Mm -hmm. I came with, I was confronted very often with this answers. In the end of the 90s, end of the 80s, we started with the neighborhood initiatives to share cars. It was very strange to share cars in the neighborhood. And then we, we grow very fast. We had 400 cars and 5,000 members. And then we looked for an investor. We didn't find an investor. Mm. Of course, it was. This was 92, 93. That was the first car sharing organization in the world. Car sharing is in the world since this time. But we failed because we didn't find an investor. Uh, then we, we developed, and after the reunification, uh, after the reunification in Germany, we had a very, very high unemployment rate in Germany. And, uh, and then we, we had the idea to, to help young people to make their own business. Very young people. And it was strange because our the decision maker and, uh, and the institution told me, you can't help young people to make their own business. They have no work experience, no life experience. It can't work. So what we started was a very, very small amount of funding. We got 50,000 German marks. That's 25,000 euros. And we opened an office. This is, um, and five years later, we were the biggest, we call it, employer in East Germany. We have created 2,000 new business with a young people in the average age of 22 without any investor. And then we came up with a, with a problem because when, we, when I went with the, with the first startups, young startups to a bank and I asked for money, I have worked in a bank before and I said it's very easy, I know everything about banks and how we get the credit. And then we came up, uh, I went with them to a bank and uh, we asked for a credit, it was only 5,000 German marks or 2,500 euros. And the bankers told us no credibility, no unemployed people, it can't work. So, and then I found an ethical bank in Germany and they give us 50,000 euro. And we set up the first microfinance system in Germany. It was, in this time, Mohamed Yunus was five, six years working or 10 years working in Bangladesh. And so we had the idea to make a specific microfinance system uh, in Germany. And we started with 50,000 euros in 1998. In 2007, we had 100 million euros to set up the system all over Germany without any investor. So that's wait, 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 wait. 
How did you make the jump? Yeah, we get we get public funding. They gave us the money as a bank. Uh -huh. So uh, so public funding, like other uh, banks, get public funding uh, to make specific loan models for uh, disadvantaged groups. So for all these models, we couldn't find a private investor because if if we would it account put put in an account if it's profitable, it wouldn't work. So that's the same when we work now with our social startups. Uh, it's very interesting if uh, now we have 300 social startups uh, supported in the last, or more, 400 almost, 400 social startups supported in the last four or five years. And for social startups, it's very, very difficult, difficult because they are not profit driven, they are mission driven, they want to change the world for a better. You can't find an investor, not in the first phase. It's very, very hard to find an investor. You have to invest in your mindset. You have to invest in collaboration. You have to invest in networks. You have to invest in, in people who, who are willing to help you to, that your business can grow. And after a while, maybe it could work. So we, we, uh, in 2012, 2013, we created a company called Oticon. It's a company for Asperger autistic people. As we know with Asperger autistic people, Asperger autistic people have no chance to get a job uh, in Germany or whatever. Uh, but Asperger autistic people have specific competences, very specific competence, because they can concentrate hours and hours on the same subject. And they have also the competence to uh, identify patterns. Mm -hmm. That's the knowledge which, uh, or competence which the IT industry needs. So we developed an IT consultant company based on the competences of Asperger autistic people. And now we have, this company has, I think, 90 Asperger autistic people who work as a t IT consultant, paid as IT consultant. And we are lucky that Richard Branson went in uh, some months ago to grow this or to support this uh, company to pick one. So, but we when didn't look for Richard Branson. When you say <laughs> <that> invest, <laughs> Inve okay. he, he was an investor, but we didn't look to him. Eventually. He came to us. That means, as if you have a good idea, uh, and you have a very, very good idea, a high-profile idea, the investor will come to you, and it's better you concentrate. That, but, I, but I can see when I work with, like I mentioned, since more than twenty years with startups, if you follow. The idea to find an investor, you don't concentrate on your business concept. Mm -hmm. You have, to have to much too much afford on, on, on how, where's the investor, how can I uh, kind of find the best investor, how can I make it uh, feasible for an investor. It doesn't work. Look to your business model, look, concentrate on your business, then make your business model, model in, a, in a case that it could, could be successful. Don't look to an investor, he will come to you. So, what is your advice for the administration in Belgrade? How can they help? To, to build an up an ecosystem, to build up an ecosystem where people have, are willing and interest and have joy and fun to make their own business. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's either investing or loaning the money or finding a, a, relative, a relevant partner. And there's also philanthropy money, is there, Hila? What actually, is the connection between philanthropy and investment and... You know, actually I am sitting next to Kunz. Yes. Only for like half an hour we know each other. But I feel it's like, it's just like the right evolution of what things should happen. Because if we come and we think when uh, in the last uh, eight years I've been working for Tel Aviv as um, promoting the ecosystem and trying to think about how are we helping young people with money and investors and and you know it, as the time comes it gets into my mind that actually the next step for these kind of things is philanthropy why am I speaking about philanthropy the the, the definition maybe some of you don't know but the just the definition of the word philanthropy is the love of mankind and when we love people we want to give. Now, I'm not just saying about donation. No, I'm not talk talking about donating. I'm talking exactly about what you're saying right now, about thinking about the right way of um, uh, um, uh, giving the opportunity to some of the great social or private, doesn't have to be, by the way, social as far as I'm concerned, as, as, as long as it's a good idea that something will, it will make the world better, 
whether it's private, where it, whether it's social, where, whether it's anything that makes you happy and, and gives you a reason to get up in the morning and make your own product and other people that will get their salaries through it and will, be, will boost economy. But philanthropists who already made it, and now in the last 10 years, you know, Airbnb was an idea on 2007. Now, the, the great students that, that made that idea, because in Silicon Valley there was no rooms um, to be in, in, in hotels, and now this great initiative, 10 years only, after they're one of the, the biggest billionaires in the world, if they'll just stop for a minute and give back through philanthropy, through the, man, the love of mankind, and remind them, remember themselves just 10 years ago as they were just like you guys, through um, um, institutions like Kunz here, that um, w with a little bit of philanthropy money, we can you know, uh, um, replace banks, like what you did, through foundations. But now we've got um, traditional foundations, but we need to make all these new financial tools. It doesn't have to be a, financial, uh, uh, a, a traditional foundation. It can be just a person that made a lot of money, and there's lots of people like that, and they make either their own foundations or their own tax deductive things or whatever, or through cities. I'm calling now cities, you know, we all have in cities economic development um, departments. We have to look for new departments that will, uh, or companies or whatever, that through there will think in philanthropy um, thinking, in the love of mankind thinking through financial tools. We have, as I talked about, City coin is the um, it's the video working? Did you get it? Okay, try it if if you if you can put it on. In Tel Aviv, we have uh, something which is um, it's not even philanthropy. It's a city coin. You can upload um, instead of a we we our money is called a shekel. So you have dollar, you have euro, in Israel you call the shekel. So you upload 100 shekels, and immediately you get 115 back. Um, so you can actually use 115. This is a way of philanthropy, because somebody made this app, and the local economy can boost through that. The video doesn't work, so you don't see it. But you can afterwards Google Kulu, C-O-L-U, it's a um, city coin that is used already in Tel Aviv, it's used already in Liverpool, it's used already in some other cities, and it's another new way of, uh, it's a social um, uh, um, currency, exactly. It's a complementary, complementary. It's, not a, a, it's not a national um, money, it's not like Bitcoin or dollar or euro or whatever, but it's a local currency that can really help um, uh, us, any one of us, and it takes the, the cost of living down, it can be used in cities, it can help people who really need just that 10% more, that 15% more of income, which is really necessary for them, and that will give them the opportunity for another course for their kids in swimming, uh, it will reduct, uh, take the price of parking off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is I can go on and talk for ages about um, uh, um, examples of so, uh, social um, products or about philanthropy, but I think it's it's a new way we should focus on it and look at it as as an opportunity and not only the private sector. George, in Silicon Valley, it's all about the money, right? Share with us the latest trends in uh, what's going on in the Silicon Valley regarding investments and entrepreneurship and all that ecosystem. Okay, um, so a lot is going on in Silicon Valley. It's kind of hard to catch up, but uh, I keep up with keep up with what's going on. But right now, um, I think, um, well, we were talking about social, so I'm going to stick with the theme. One thing that did not happen as much before is um, social impact investing or impact investing was not as popular in Silicon Valley. And there used to be very few funds that focused on that. Um, around the US you would find more, but Silicon Valley always um, was less interested in that. But in the last couple of years, we see a lot more um, interest in 
in um, social investing or impact investing or investing in like sustainable products and, um, and figuring out um, better ways to, um, to support those, um, those projects in terms of like having, having an impact and those projects being socially driven, uh, having a social mission and vision behind it. Um, that's why I think like one of the things that are, that is very popular among investors right now is food tech. And um, because we have way too many people on the planet and at some point all this, uh, all the food resources we have is not gonna be enough. And, and also there is the humane side of it, the way we treat animals, et cetera. So um, meatless meat has been very popular in San Francisco, just among the people that live there. Like we go to restaurants and there are a lot of places that offer a meatless burger, but it tastes exactly like meat. So um, I think like food tech is a big, big area that a lot more uh, funds are gonna be focusing on. Of course, there's the robotics and AI side of the things that's becoming extremely uh, important, which is which will definitely have its social consequences, meaning taking away jobs from people and um, robots or AI replacing a lot of um, working class jobs. So that's definitely come with its um, social problems. Um, and so that's a big area. And of course, AR, VR is very popular among investors right now. But um, but we see a lot, so what, what one of the activities we have under our firm is to help um, different family offices set up their venture capital practice. So we're, I'm talking about, like let's say, I was just in Guatemala sitting down with the biggest coffee producer in the country and the guy sells to like Starbucks, Pete's, Costa Coffee, all these like big um, coffee chains. And they are now setting up their own in-house venture capital practice to be able to invest directly. And they're very interested in um, social driven startups. So they wanna do most of like impact investing. And we see that a lot, in, um, a lot more often now compared to like five, six years ago, which is definitely a good sign. And Silicon Valley, I'm not saying they didn't care about that before, but there were maybe three, four funds that will look at that. Now it's, I would say, maybe 30, 40% of the funds in the Valley are... Um, do do angels and investors uh, go about the trends? Do they also follow the trends or do they have, or are they open to hearing everything that their entrepreneur has to offer? How do they judge? In when a young entrepreneur would like to approach, yeah. should they follow the trends or, sh or, are, or do they have the same chance if they come up with their own idea uh, original idea and just come to present it. Well, usually, Who has the best chance? Yeah, usually for first time investors, first time angel investors, they like to stick with their own domain expertise. Mm. So if the guy comes from a healthcare background, so he would probably want to invest in healthcare rela related startups, but that's changing now because uh, angel groups are way more popular compared to the past. Like in the past, you would find maybe one or two angel groups uh, in any given city, sometimes like none depending on where, what area we're talking about but now in every city there are like lots of angel groups which means the angel even if he has a specific domain expertise he can rely on the due diligence and expertise of his peers in the angel group so he can technically invest in um, other areas but also uh, you have a lot of online crowdfunding platforms like AngelList so on AngelList you have all these big name investors that um, let you in on their on their syndicates. So you have a very famous um, tech investor that lets maybe 100, 200 people in, in a syndicate. And you can you can join those investments with as little as $5,000. So it's a great opportunity for you to build your portfolio strategy while you're still learning without necessarily having to come from that specific background. So the, the dynamics of angel investing is very different from years ago, but if you're gonna directly reach out to an angel investor, I would, that is not on angel list or that does not belong to an angel group, I would probably um, stick with an angel who knows that space and who comes from that domain expertise. Smart money. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Norbert, in Germany, what are the challenges for, th for social innovation uh, that are still left? We, we haven't conquered all of them, right? So 
what challenges are in front of you? I think we have specific challenges in Germany. We like uh, each country has their specific challenges, but we all have global challenges. And I think uh, if you look for a trend in, in the whole uh, scene, you will see that we have uh, uh, very similar trends all over the world. But maybe I will start with the other, um, the other remark is, uh, we all, well, some of us had read uh, the global risk report of the World Economy Forum, I think. And they came to the conclusion that capitalism is no, has no future. So that means they came also to the conclusion that an economy which is based on the theory of growth and profit orientation has no future. So that means the World Economy Forum came to this conclusion. So we have to think about a new economy. We have to think that we have to rebuild or relaunch our economy. That means we have to think about uh, the future of our economy and we need a new type of economy. And we need uh, an economy which is not profit driven. We need an economy which is social driven. And so we have these challenges. Uh, uh, World Economy Forum says the biggest challenge we have is, ecologic, is uh, climate change and the global inequality. It's are the biggest challenges we, have, we are faced to. And for this reason, we have to, to have to act in a different manner. So that we have to do this here. And when we look to the trends, maybe in, in Germany, but I think it's everywhere more or less the same, we see uh, that we have much more initiatives, social startups and social business who work on social innovation uh, it's much more than before so to build up sustainable business, social business concepts. Uh, that's one trend we can see. Another trend we can see is, uh, maybe when I look back maybe in the 90s and the beginning of the new century, all social issues were, were a task of uh, public and civil society. Now we work more on a cross-sectoral approach in the development of social innovation are uh, corporates involved, are the welfare uh, and, uh, involved, the public sector is involved. So it's a much more cross-sectoral approach, and more, more and more people get involved in these processes. I think in our, in our uh, example, we have, I think, 400 or 500 mentors from corporate partners who work with us together to develop social innovation. So that's a, uh, the third trend we can see uh, is that the, the social actors or the social business or social startups work in a collaborative manner. So they don't work compet as competitors with each other, so some they, they start to help each other to, to make these business concepts much more successful. We have so many teams who work crossover uh, to develop uh, social, social services and social. Next trend maybe is uh, that all of them work on, on digital technology. Uh, that's also new because when, if you look backwards, social service providers has no idea about digital. <laughs> so that uh, uh, is also a challenge. Next uh, on a trend, the next trend is when I look backwards in my own past, uh, I did, did a lot on social projects. In the, in the past, social projects were, were focused on local specifics. But now the, the social initiatives and social business are all thinking a holistic, scalable structure. They want to be, they want scale their ideas. They look much more to the future of our, of our worlds and they look for uh, a, a small solution in our city. So we have some trends and you can see these trends are very similar. Not only in Germany, we will see the same trends, I think, definitely in, in Israel or or we have we made a boot camp in India four weeks ago. We had the same people who work on a social change. They have the same approach, the same ideas, and same mission. Okay. So um, the final round would be, I think, uh, for each of you to recommend to these young people sitting here how to go about um, achieving their dream and uh, coming out with a product either in social areas or in financial or food tech or whatever. How, what is your advice to young entrepreneurs from Belgrade, from uh, Central Eastern Europe in this, in this point in time? 
Um, so I'm, I think I'm going to start with a negative note before I just go into that because one thing I'm observing is, or it, entrepreneurship is so popular, it's become so mainstream. Uh, I hear from parents around the world that their kids don't want to take a job anymore. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur and wants to start a startup. Um, so I think before you take that route, you need to know that like very few startups actually become successful. Um, when you look at tech news, you always hear about funding rounds and exits and all these successful acquisition stories because no one makes news about failure stories. There are way more failure stories out there than success stories, so just keep that in mind before you um, go out there and start your own thing. But, um, and I'm not saying that to discourage you, but I think it's good to know um, the you know, the, the, the reality of the entrepreneurial world, it's very hard. And as, as, uh, as my colleague was saying, you probably will fail the first time, the second time. Many successful entrepreneurs, they, they got it right maybe um, after like two, sec two three times. Um, serial entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, serial entrepreneurs, exactly, exactly. So, um, but if, you decide, if you're really passionate about something and if you really want to give it a try, I would say, make sure that you build a product that people want to use and and before you build it talk to talk to potential customers talk to um those people who would actually be paying for a product or service from you make sure that you have some traction and dealing with investors um that's probably the most important thing for investors it's going to be very hard for you for um for them to write a check to you if you don't have any users, if you have not generated any and revenue. So initially, focus on traction. Um, try to be very lean about building your product. And, um, and you have, um, once you have passion and, um, and perseverance around it, I think um, it's, it's an easier start. Thank you, Hila. Yeah. So to wrap up, I'd like to give two hints. One is when you have an opportunity to speak up, use it. Does anyone have any question or want to ask something now? Mm. For anyone here in, a, in the panel? Yes. Yeah. How do you test ideas? Because it's not a bad idea to make a mobile app or a bad idea. Anyone from the panel want to answer? <laughs> to prove your ideas so, so early as possible, we call it rapid prototyping. You mean that you develop an idea and you ask your potential customers of the, if they are really interested in this idea and ask so early as, as possible. And it's not bad to fail. It's also one strategy is to fail very often but very early, so that you can <laughs> have the chance to cor to make correction on your on your business idea and to learn. So thank you. That was my first hint to get to use your opportunity and very good that you used it. The second one, as my colleague said, was just really stick to your guts. If you, if you are waking up in the morning and you love what you do and you're passionate about it and you're having fun, continue. This is what life is all about. Just enjoy it. I mean, the sun is out there. Go and enjoy it. You're, whatever you do, you'll either succeed or you'll fail. It's okay. It's part of life. It's part of process. You learn. If, it, if you'll fail, you'll learn from it. And if you'll succeed, wow, everyone will applaud. So the, as, as long as you guys will enjoy it, and this is what I'm um, for myself and for my kids and for my partner, for my friends, I insist all the time, let's enjoy life. So after this um, uh, session, not this session, after this summit. Just make sure tonight that you enjoy life. Thank you, Hila. Norbert. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, have the, I have the same uh, <laughs> recommendation. Uh, if, you w w if you want, have a better chance to be happy and successful both. Follow your own mission. Thank you very much. So I would like uh, to thank everybody. I would like to thank um, Turche for representing San Francisco, Hila for representing Tel Aviv, and Norbert for representing Berlin. Three amazing, innovative cities that have actually performed so wonderfully, so keep it up. And thank you, everybody. Yeah, a question? Yes, please.
Okay, so uh, let Torche. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, uh, you want to say something? Torche about it? first, and then um, I and I think that there's a very easy way to tackle that. Um, so we work with six thousand investors from around the world, and they invest across the border. And some of the countries that they invest in are not f investor friendly at all. But um, in the startup world, unless you're um, you're in a very um, tax wise and regulation wise friendly place. The industry standard is that you just set up an entity in Delaware, or maybe in Europe there are other places, but in the US we always like tell startups to, even if you're in, based in the US, even if you're in San Francisco. So here's the thing with San Francisco startups, all these successful companies that you hear about, Uber, Airbnb, none of them are registered in California. So even Silicon Valley companies are registered in Delaware. So it's an industry standard. It's very easy. You can do it online. You don't have to live there. You don't have to be a US citizen. There are websites that help you with that. The most popular would be bizfilings.com. So you just go there, you spend $300, you just set up an online entity in Delaware, and that's the entity that um, all the investors would use to invest in. So the, your country not being investor friendly is not a reason for investors not to invest in, unless there are some political risks. Like that's the situation in Turkey right now, where I'm from. Investors don't invest in Turkish startups, not because they don't want to invest in a Turkish entity, but they just don't think a startup operating in Turkey under those conditions can be successful for, for different reasons. So. so that's a great practical advice. And now let's hear from Ila, so that, who is a, yeah. a civil servant, and uh, in the eyes of the government, the local government, let's hear your answer. So again, I also learned just now something from my own uh, startup that we have at home, so I'm going to elaborate on that with you later on. But <laughs> it's all about people. So as a city maker, approach the city, but I think there's a great powerhouse just here in this uh, audience. Milena, are you here? Where's Milena? Okay. Working working, so approach her later. I think the way she empowered this little summit, she can help so much, in the, and at the end of the day, it's about people. You go and you approach someone that you know, he will help you, he will help you to approach the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and then you see that barriers will um, um, get off. So start with Milena, I know she'll help you. Thank you for bringing us here. Okay, thank you very much, guys. I'm very happy to introduce to you four people from three countries. Ivan Gligorievich will talk about connecting the brains of his team in health uh, startup and brain train. Helen Martinet will be moderating the session and you can talk to her about the movement Citizens Awakening that, that did so many fantastic things for young people. 
outside of this region as well. William Carbone will be talking about uh, IBM's uh, data um, infrastructure and how he, as a young man under 30, contributes to this um, data analytics. And Jovan Simic, who you know, not only if you attend Exit Festival, but also if you are a big fan of um, helping community, you will get to hear from him about fantastic way of collecting half million euros for charity in 10 days. So I think there's plenty of reasons to be wake up, right? Hello, everybody. So, um, first, maybe I would like to introduce uh, this amazing panel, Wearing Your Data, Wearing Your Heart in Business. Um, so, I will ask the panelists to introduce themselves first, really quickly. And after, we will start with a question again. So hello everyone, it's William here. I come from Italy and I work in Slovakia, in Bratislava. I've been working there for six years as a Watson uh, Cognitive Solutions Leader. And I'm so happy to be here. Let's give an applause to the organizers and to all of you who are in, who's in the room. Thank you. Hello, well, I'm uh, Jovan, I'm from Belgrade. And I'm uh, organizing charity uh, charity events that are uh, uh, then I'm trying to mix them with uh, sport and uh, maybe you've heard uh, of uh, jersey selling for a little Nadja or uh, charity football games so that's like the thing I do hi everyone I'm Ivan um, I work in a uh, research slash healthcare uh, brainwave reading uh, company called M Brain Train. Uh, I ended up there by chance. I just wanted to make something that reads your brain activity, and then uh, I realized several years later that I'm stuck to it and I'm still in it, and uh, I'm happy to be here at this panel. Okay, and I'm Ellen Martino. I'm, uh, I'm 21 years old, and I created this organization called Citizen Awakening Hungary. We deal with trying to reconnect the citizens with the political sphere, um, with the use of technologies, because we want to empower people and redefine the meaning of citizenship. And today, I'm moderator of this panel. So I think we should start with the first question. How did the word data transform? And I would like Ivan to start. Uh, well, of course, I can just give my my view on the thing so um, i i was reading about uh, big data and data scientists like googling and i realized oh actually i am a data scientist actually the, my previous uh, uh, period when when i was a phd student in belgium uh, a lot of techniques that we were using like blind source separation independent component analysis principal component analysis support vector machines everything that we use there uh, basically you know, belongs in the field of data science, only it wasn't called like that. Why is it so, become such a big fuzz? Well, uh, for me, uh, from my perspective, it is because the computational power became more available. So just imagine you have your devices, your phones, everything, and your data, you just uh, do a click or two clicks, and somewhere, poof, what you want is presented to you. Behind that, that place, there is some computational power that is just now available to all of us. And that's why, uh, that's why uh, everything is just coming to be right now. A lot of th these things are uh, things that existed before, including what we now address as artificial intelligence. These algorithms are advancing, but they were there before as well. The other crucial thing I is uh, mobile phones. Uh, mobile phones with their, uh, with the sheer number that uh, that they started appearing, uh, became uh, actually brought the the price of sensors down, 
And uh, uh, now, you know, imagine what you have in your phone. You have accelerometers, you have gyroscopes, you have GPS, you have touch sensors, you have temperature sensors, you have, you know, uh, the list goes on. And uh, the, this actually made it possible for a lot of uh, hardware to be developed that can uh, track you in this or that way, present you some benefit. Uh, and uh, a lot of startups uh, can uh, and, and companies can can exploit uh, that that fact. For me, th these things are actually what uh, what what made the change and what you know constitute the world today. Uh, what is the question? Same or? Oh, do you agree with uh, what Ivan said about accessibility with mobile phone around data, the multiplication of data? What are your own opinion with your own initiatives? From your point of view, um, how did the word data transform? Well, uh, in my case, uh, medias have uh, shown to be very crucial because uh, uh, when I wanted to sell my jerseys, and that uh, that uh, supposed to be a local thing, but uh, be because of the medias that uh, have uh, became the zakutas. <laughs> Can you talk on Serbian and he will translate because I'm so nervous and I can speak in English. I do the answer, <laughs> no, no. Dakle, u mom slučaju su se mediji pokazali jako bitni i prenos informacija kroz, kroz taj način zbog toga što uh, kad sam ja krenuo u akciju, to je trebalo da bude na jednom lokalnom nivou, onako da se skupimo svi u jednoj osnovnoj školi, ali na kraju to je zbog jednog uh, novinarskog članka i tu se pokazalo samo da uh, koliko brzo informacije putuju. So for me, uh, the media affected uh, what I do really a lot, because um, uh, if without them it was supposed to be local, everything started as a local oriented thing. And then due to just one media article, uh, everything spread around so quickly and uh, this is what they wanted to do. Da, i dakle, u principu zbog jednog uh, novinarskog članka i zbog jednog novinara koji je uh, usmirio svu svoju snagu da ljudima prikaže tu priču o prode i dresova, umjesto da usmiri svoju snagu da proda ljudima priču iz nekog reality showa, Ta priča je postala državno pitanje broj jedan i pokazala je smisao medija i informacija da kada dođu do pravih ljudi u današnjem svijetu. So uh, due to a journalist that uh, that realized that uh, he wanted to to tell a story about uh, about uh, uh, football wear uh, football clothing uh, instead of uh, retelling a reality uh, reality show like uh, others. Uh, uh, made, made it uh, into headlight media and uh, made it pr uh, news number one at the end of the story. Okay. William? Okay. So thanks so much for the inputs. <laughs> uh, I think I have a question for you or a statement. Uh, do you know that people have more access to mobile phones than to toilets in the world? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's something, right? okay. <laughs> And uh, we are big data generators. Uh, it's one of the natural resources now. It has become a natural, very expensive natural resource. And uh, there are a lot of efforts from companies to understand how we can use the data that we produce. Uh, basically, 80% uh, of the data produced is unstructured. 20% unstructured means that imagine you come to the theater and all the chairs are all over, like on the roof, uh, on the ceiling, everywhere. They're not like here. This is structured data, right? So imagine you need to put all the chairs in order. And uh, you need basically a system. You need to have something that helps you to do that. Because you have a lot of media, a lot of audio files, a lot of text. You produce a lot of stuff with your Facebook, with our Facebook. Everybody uses that. And uh, what's behind that? Uh, we need to understand that uh, times have changed. Uh, we are trying to um, 
put some, some limits to that. Uh, all the companies are trying to build more and more storage rooms, but that will not help them to overcome the big data generator that the internet has become. Uh, I can show you some example of the work that I've done uh, in my um, organization. This should work. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so basically, um, my organization consists of 400 people, and we, um, we had a big data problem because uh, we have a lot of business analysts who are producing tremendous amounts of data. And uh, that means that it's also confidential data, so you need to take care of security, a lot of matters. And um, basically, it has not been uh, easy to build uh, a journey into big data because uh, people were really uh, resilient. They didn't consider an analytics uh, culture to, to be in. So what can I can give you as a recommendation if you're trying to implement analytics in your, uh, in your organization. And I give you also an example of what analytics is and what business intelligence is, okay? So the business intelligence is like uh, uh, understanding the weather uh, from two weeks ago or last month, analyzing the, the, the weather forecast, uh, sorry, the weather two weeks ago. Analytics is about what the weather will be or will look like in two weeks. So it's a step, step forward. And uh, you should also, uh, you should make it so with the art of possible. That's what INAT is about also. <laughs> and you need to find out the use cases within your, your organization. So uh, what can you use as a big data analytics example? Uh, it can be one, one role in your company as well. And then uh, there should be the mission requirements, not more than four because then it starts to get a bit, uh, bit difficult. And uh, you need to build the use case. So what I did, I took some roles, I took people, and I, start, I made them to write a story about how they changed the work from uh, Excel copy-paste way to, to big data analytics, right? To an analytics um, platform. So we actually had uh, uh, some software that helps us. And uh, you can also share it with clients. Once that, that's ready, uh, you can have an inventory. That's also another big data adder. Uh, to, the, to your assets, and actually you are able to scale it and in three different features with uh, volume, variety, and velocity. These are the three main characteristics of the, the big data uh, scenario. Um, it's just a big word. There are many, many of those buzzwords, and uh, there are a lot of efforts from different companies to make it happen. Uh, for example, IBM is using the cognitive computing, and everybody uses artificial intelligence, uh, but these are only efforts for the companies to understand uh, what what uh, they can do with the data. Um, you can even invest in that because many companies are offering the data to be analyzed, so you can make some, some good money with that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, jumping to the second question, um, to Ivan and, you, and Jovan, uh, when did you know you will succeed? Um, when, when was the point when you realized that what you were doing was, was going to be to be a success. When did you know that? Uh, well, <laughs> I still don't know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But I think it, uh, success is a very, um, very re relative term. Uh, because, and, and our concept, concept of it is very uh, distorted in a way. Uh, because uh, it, it was before uh, in scientific world that you know, people who are not in, in, in that are thinking of this uh, voila moment, you know, I'm taking a bath and I have this great idea and then everything comes out. Yeah, in reality, it's, uh, it's about uh, a lot of work. And this, uh, this word, word perseverance is basically telling if you're there long enough, your chances are, uh, are of success are higher. Why is that? Because, you know, whatever you're doing, if you're long enough in the field, you're building your expertise. And you may pivot a bit, you may uh, offer this or that solution, but you are building your expertise. You are investing a lot of time in it, and, you know, that creates value. We, uh, we are living in, uh, in a world that is, uh, that, that where we can easily be deceived. Uh, we, we think of success as uh, uh, coming very fast. All the major companies, if you, with the exception of Amazon, which took three years to, to succeed, took considerably more. Apple took 20 years, you know, and, and there was, <laughs> I was on a forum and um, actually there was a statistics which I rechecked myself and it said that 
what we consider, what we perceive as overnight success is on average 8.25 years. So uh, if you, and you can really do that for yourself, just, you know, uh, companies that you know out of your mind, just, you know, check, check the, their history, check their revenue per years, and you will see, uh, you will see what happened. So uh, it's important that uh, you build on, on your expertise, that you don't give up easily. Again, I, I, I remembered something. I spoke with, the, with a friend of mine uh, who, is, uh, who is in a startup world, a great guy. And when we met each other, he has a lot to share. When we met each other, uh, he said, I had so, mu so many failures in, uh, in startups. You know, I, I have failed 10 times. We tried this, we failed. This we failed. And I'm looking at him, and he's, he's a relatively young guy. And I'm thinking to myself, how did you have time to fail? You know, setting aside all, all of these things. So in my view, I still don't know specifics, but in my, uh, in my view, he, he, he didn't stay long enough in any of the fields to actually give it a, s a chance to succeed. So what we are now doing is uh, we are just you know, scratching the surface. We have uh, happy users. We are present in more than 15 countries. Uh, we are living off where, of what we make and sell. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't consider it absolute in any way. I see that uh, we have a huge way in front of us. During the process, I believe I lost a lot of my arrogance. I, I, I think I, when I was younger, I was way more uh, arrogant uh, in, in thinking and, and opened my views. And I, I think this is the major thing, you know, building on your qualities and opening your views. And, you know, don't, don't just go for for the money, you know, if you do if you do it for the money, you're likely to fail. Hvala <laughs> i kroz utakmice, i kroz dresove, i kroz sve, znači će da sam uspeo kada uspem da promenim taj neki mindset kod ljudi. So it's, uh, I feel like uh, you're all laughing so that I feel, that makes me feel like a stand-up comedian, which is not so bad. Uh, even though I co collected uh, more than half a million euros uh, uh, in the previous uh, part, I don't consider it uh, success until I do what I want to do, and that is change the mindset of people. Zato što u svakoj akciji svoj ja pokušam da okupim ljude na jednom mestu oko nečega, jer mislim da je to u ovom društvu malo zaboravljeno i da su se ljudi nekako otuđili. I od, evo, sad vi listate svoje telefone, vi listate svoje telefone i to je ono što pokušam da promenim isto. Dakle, kad se skupimo svi na jednom mestu, da pokušamo da napravimo neku stvar koja je normalna i pristojna, a pogotovo kad je nekome potrebna pomoć. What I'm trying to do is make people come together, sit together and not become more alienated than they are. Even now, when I see you, a lot of you are using your phones, checking something. Uh, instead of just being closer together, uh, which, is, uh, which is my goal. Da, kad se pojavi neki problem, kad je neku bolest i kad nekom treba pomoć, vjerojatno ćemo da prvo kažemo to bi trebala da reši država, sistem ili crkva, ali nije tako. U principu danas je tako vreme da jedino ljudi kad se okupe i udruže što se dokazalo i kad smo se, kad, kad se zanađu skupilo 300.000 evra u roku od 5 dana, kad pre 3 godine kad je bolesna bila, to nije bila niti država, niti crkva, ni tiko, to su bili ljudi koji su se okupili oko jednog cilja i koji su obratili pažnju na nečiji problem. So it's, a, it's about gathering people around the common goal. Uh, our usual reaction when there is a problem is we expect somebody else to solve it, the state, the church, whoever. And, uh, but in reality, people are those who have the power to, uh, to solve problems. Uh, there is an example of a little girl that was uh, very ill. She needed uh, money very quickly for surgery, skipping all the pr procedures, and it was made possible by a group of people who, who managed to communicate this and in a matter of days connect, uh, collect 300,000 
euros. Uh, and this is what, uh, what uh, I'm trying to do, to bring people together and to make them Tako da, eto, kad ljudi shvate samo da je to poenta, da je danas, nažalost, tako vreme, da samo jedni drugima možemo da pomognemo, a ne može niko drugi da nam pomogne, niko drugi na koga mi računamo taj famozni sistem koji ne prepoznaje niti vaš problem, niti šta, ali taj čovjek koji sedi pored vas prepoznaje vaš problem i pomoći će vam i samo to želim da ljudi shvate da je bitno da se okrenemo jedni drugima koliko god da nas je vreme i otuđilo i život i brzina i sve, mi moramo da se okrenemo jedni drugima i da jedni drugima pomognemo na ovim način i kad to ljudi skapiraju, tada ću znati da sam uspeo. So the only way to live in these days is to help each other out because the system and everything is too abstract the uh, system doesn't know what you need, uh, how to help you, uh, or will go and help you. But the person, the person, the man next to you can and will. He can understand you and he'll, he can help you out. And uh, even in, uh, it's important in this alienated time to realize that and you know, start relying on people and change the mindset in that direction to you know, start helping each other out. And that's my goal, to you know, make people uh, think and do like this. Wow, very inspiring. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for both of you. Um, another question, uh, two questions actually for William. Um, what benefits entrepreneurs and big companies have from using IBM Watson? And what are best resources to get informed about data mining, analyzing data and making more aware decisions about data? Oh, that's a long question. <laughs> very, very long question. <laughs> it's really nice for me. Uh, so, who is familiar with IBM Watson in this room? IBM Watson. Oh, okay. Uh, so, basically, uh, some years ago, uh, it's the start of a new story, uh, the, the company IBM decided to create a system that was able to uh, listen, uh, observe, interact, and, and uh, express himself like a human. Uh, it's not artificial intelligence uh, because it's a step forward after artificial intelligence um, it has a lot of application so the system is able to basically interact with the users it, it does it in different ways uh, of course it's a very ambitious project uh, but nowadays we're really experiencing something really really good uh, that it's happening uh, your generation will be the one basically who will benefit the most uh, because uh, you will have it more and more into your daily life um, of course, we're not talking about only IBM, because when I talk about uh, cognitive computing, or which is kind of IBM-branded uh, solution at the moment, I'm thinking that also competition will open the eyes like Amazon or Google. Uh, of course, we're not the only ones, uh, but the, the journey is really like uh, on creating these cognitive assistants uh, that are able to help you in a daily basis. I created a video for you. If the, it, it, it's an application of Watson for uh, the oncology. Um, oh, the audio, yeah. Just a second. <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, it's... Medical data doubles every three years, and the $7 trillion health industry is unable to keep up with the staggering rate at which information is produced. From medical records, clinical trials, and research, to personal fitness bands, implanted devices, and other sensors that collect real-time data, each of us can generate the equivalent of 300 million books of health-related data in our lifetime. In fact, approximately 35 cents of every dollar spent on medical care is wasted. And yet, there is a reason for hospitals, doctors, insurers, and patients alike to be optimistic about the future. The reason is Watson Health Cloud. The IBM Watson Health Cloud brings together vast sets of medical data into one centralized thinking hub on the cloud, combining traditional analytics with the advanced cognitive capabilities of Watson the ability to learn and over time refine its analysis based on what it is learning, to turn this wealth of data into knowledge. Take Raul. Raul has a family, a busy job, and an active lifestyle. He also has a heart condition. It's mild, but it could worsen over time. He works closely with his doctor to monitor the problem, but they have difficulty finding medication that doesn't limit his busy lifestyle. And with the mountain of medical data available, it's nearly impossible to keep up with the latest treatments. Raul's doctor starts using a new app created from the Watson Health Cloud. It allows him to review Raul's personal and family medical history from other doctors, even insurance providers. 
and incorporate that information with data from Raoul's Fitbit. This provides both Raoul and his doctor with meaningful insights about his condition over time. Watson Health Cloud operates in an ecosystem environment. As in nature, an ecosystem brings together many contributors to keep the system functioning smoothly. Watson Health Cloud's ecosystem functions much the same way. It combines massive amounts of data and knowledge and brings together researchers, doctors, patients, pharmaceutical companies, and insurers in a secure and open platform. As Raoul and his doctor continue to use Watson Health Cloud through the app, the app contributes that data back into the Watson ecosystem. This give and take makes Watson Health Cloud more dynamic, intelligent, and efficient for everyone. The app combines knowledge about Raoul's heart condition with data in the Watson Health Cloud from patients with the same condition. Using analytics and insights, the app makes the best recommendations for Raoul's care. When a new study suggests a correlation between an allergy medication Raoul takes and increased risk of heart disease, the app alerts Raoul's doctor and suggests a possible replacement medication. Since the app knows Raoul is an avid runner, the app suggests a medication that doesn't interfere with strenuous physical activity. Raoul never has to worry about his medical privacy because IBM goes to great lengths to keep knowledge about patients private and anonymous, ensuring that before any of Raoul's medical records reach the cloud, they are stripped of any and all personal identifiers. This process refers to de-identification services, which are crucial to creating a safe, secure cloud environment. As the knowledge base continues to grow, apps built using the Watson Health Cloud enable researchers, doctors, and pharmaceutical companies to drive medical advancements and improve patient outcomes. Physicians can be more confident and accountable in their treatments, and individuals like Raoul can be more responsible for their own health and wellness by taking preventative action. IBM Watson Health Cloud is rapidly transforming healthcare around the world. Its advanced cognitive capabilities, interactive ecosystem, and secure de-identification dramatically change the dynamic between patients, doctors, and the medical community, creating a brighter, healthier future for all. Thank you. So, yeah. there are a lot of implications with that. First of all, it's security, and we have also privacy problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, if it's because you actually your doctor or your system will have a lot of information about you, maybe more information about yourself that you even know uh, already. And it can be very, very scary because uh, who can get this data and uh, in which hands there will be one day this data, right? So the security is very, very, very uh, important uh, parameter of that. And when we talk about data, uh, at the end of the day, uh, your DNA data, your um, health data are just uh, one and zero. Uh, it's a binary code that goes into the machine. Uh, so your blood values, everything goes into a code, which is a bit weird, uh, but that's how it goes. And uh, these machines are able to learn from that. So in case you, um, people will need a chemotherapy, now there is just a standard therapy, right? Uh, it, you just get that for, for everybody. But in the future, you will have just uh, your own um, kind of um, care, like your own symptoms and your own care for that. So you don't have to follow uh, a standard process that everybody does. So just because 80 of, there is 80% of chance of survival doesn't mean that it's the right one for you. Uh, because people can be in those 20% who don't survive with that particular care. So by combining your DNA data, your uh, parents' data, like your uh, genetical data, basically, uh, you can get be better mapping, even for the doctor, uh, to do that. And how systems are helping that, actually, uh, we, we will come out with the entrepreneurs as well later. <laughs> um, it's because uh, doctors cannot keep up with the amount of publications. There are 3,000 publications a day they cannot learn that, it's impossible. They need a machine. Uh, when they were challenging Watson, because Watson can learn, so you can put all the data you want there and it's going to learn it uh, in live. Um, the doctor, the very, very good doctors in the US uh, found out maybe three uh, solutions to a symptom, but Watson found out five. And five, two of them were actually possible, but the doctors were not fresh of study, of course, so they forgot about the two. And imagine how many people can be saved if uh, you, know, you have a machine uh, that doesn't work uh, for you, of course. It works with you. So you have an interaction with that machine. So that's one of the key points uh, of, of the system and how it works. So it's very complex. We tried to do it a cartoon because it's very complicated in the background. So I hope it made the idea. 
And uh, for the entrepreneurs, uh, very good question, because um, uh, there is a need now. Uh, the startup is a very big buzzword, and there are many people with uh, few resources. Maybe you cannot invest so much in hardware, and uh, you cannot invest into coding. So IBM did a big effort into creating an API interface so that uh, people can start coding on their own in Bluemix. And uh, it, it's a key point because uh, if you want to just uh, prove your idea that this may be working or not, you can create it on a platform called Bluemix. And uh, you can make your customers to try it. So you can have a proof of concept before you start investing maybe 100,000 euros into that. And I think it's, it's very important, especially if you are a, a young entrepreneur with no resources but with a very good idea and vision, uh, that you put um, yourself into coding if, even if you're not a programmer. Uh, and you make it uh, to work. There is another video uh, on um, on that. Not sure if you are good with the timing. Um, that, then at the next one. Maybe. Okay. Banks face no, many challenges as they. Yeah. <laughs> That's about big data. <laughs> this one is about money. That's about money. It's a use case for big data and finance. Watson is a new technology that is based on uh, the principles of natural language processing, natural language understanding. These are computers or systems that learn. They have the ability to ingest enormous amounts of information. We have very deliberately created the Watson platform as a cloud offering. You can build your own application, you can build uh, a business around a solution that you want to create by introducing it as a set of APIs. We're enabling entrepreneurs and innovators to go solve those problems in ways that we can't even imagine. We work in things as diverse as robotics, toy companies, knowledge firms and engineering firms. It's very nimble, it's very fast, and it's just been great working with them because they've got some of the brightest minds really focused on this technology. They put a lot behind it and we see it on our side. We're drowning in data, a challenge in our environment is to be able to process enough information to make a good investment decision. So with Watson, we're able to really um, take a lot of information, uh, some people might call it dark data, things like editorial, uh, reviews, blogs, and synthesize that to be able to provide recommendations that are most relevant for you. The really exciting thing is that we're opening up a new location in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley. It is the birthplace of innovation, of startup technologies, of the venture community. It's really important for us to be able to get access and give our technology to these startups as they're in their formative days. Only IBM could do this. Partnerships, ecosystems are part of our core values, and systems like Watson are going to transform industries. Okay, um, so last question, but it's behind this little nice paper. Wait. Actually, it's a question for all of us, and it's how will, you, how will we continue to engage users in the future stage of our initiative or business? So how will you keep the users of our initiative in the future? That's a more than a million dollar question, yeah. so... The only thing that you cannot uh, guess so easily is whether somebody will like your product in the end. I mean, look, you have Google, and Google makes a product, invests, I don't know what resources, at, at the end of the day, this product doesn't go. I'm sure that they have uh, followed every good practice in designing the product, testing the market, doing all kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, people just decided not to use it. For us, uh, I also had a small video, but I'm not sure whether people are, uh, you know, in the video mode. Um, anyway, I'm. Uh, we are. Uh, we are. We we made a, a big breakthrough in in research uh, brainwave reading. But at the end of the day, this is a cap on your head. What this enabled us to do is to see a lot of benefits that everyday people could have if they had brainwave readings in ev everyday life. Uh, but we also discovered that people are not willing, even with the greatest uh, design that you can provide, to wear something on their head just for the purpose of brainwave reading. That's our uh, market insight. 
we came up with something that we consider to be solving that problem. And I'm really hoping, so we managed to put in brainwave recordings into headphones, into smart headphones that people anyway uh, use. So we are not trying to create a new habit. And uh, you know, if, uh, let's say, uh, in a world that, that, we, with, that we see uh, happening, uh, you will have brainwave readings uh, that, uh, benefiting your everyday life, helping you achieve helping you de-stress, helping you focus, guiding other systems like music players and so on. Uh, and uh, on top of that, you will have all these extra benefits because this data, anonymized, uh, of course, will be sent to platforms like Watson uh, or TensorFlow or any kind of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the data analytics platform behind it and uh, can be uh, can serve to uh, predict the upcoming uh, uh, physical conditions, but uh, also uh, to point the, the baseline change in your uh, healthy brain functioning. So you don't have to be, uh, let's say, ill to be stressed out or, or not being happy as you used to be or uh, Things, uh, things on that line. I think this is uh, this is crucial. And uh, more globally, in a startup world now, because everything is more available, you have you can create stuff more easily, and you can communicate it. Uh, another buzzword is value. You know, creating value. But you know, if you think about this word, this is uh, this is the essence. If somebody has value from from what you do. Uh, then he will do it. If he doesn't have value, he will not do it. Imagine you asking me to fill in a, a questionnaire of three pages. If I see at the end of these three pages something that I really like, I will fill it in. Otherwise, I will, I will not. Would you agree actually with William when he said that we should uh, bring uh, technologies and uh, employees or workers together to make it more efficient? Would you say the same? That humans should work with machines and technologies? Yes, that's a, na that's a natural process. process. We, we, I mean, regardless of what we hear, think, or say, this will, this will happen. And I think that, uh, that you know, um, uh, we as a human species, we progress because we are able to anticipate. So it's important to anticipate uh, what, will, what will happen, you know. And for instance, where, where this artificial intelligence will fit in, uh, and so on and so forth. So this will happen, and now we, it's our task to see how to get uh, most of it. Okay, th oh, this, 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 was, this is a m music from my video. Our state-of-the-art wireless CG system smarting. I don't okay, so you have to believe me, it's state-of-the-art, and it's wireless. It's there is there is no need actually we can we can skip it and uh, you can. Yeah, no, no, we do. Tako da. Ove, ja smo stali. Da, pa ništa. Ja mogu da pričam iz ugla humanitarnih akcija zato što ove se time bavim. Tako da kako privući ljude. Ono što ću sad reći možda da zvuči malo teško, ali je na žalost realno. To sam skladio kroz ove tri godine čime se bavim. Vi danas kad se kad pravite humanitarnu akciju vi se u isto vrijeme bavite i marketingom isto zato što koliko god to teško zvučalo vi morate da ljudima da ih naterate da oni daju pare za neku priču dakle to je isto kao da im nešto prodajete ali ne zarad profita nego im prodajete da bi oni dali pare u neke humanitarne svrhe so uh, being in humanitarian area uh, it's also important to realize that today, uh, whether you want it or not, if you want to be a, human, a humanitarian worker, uh, you have to g uh, dig into the marketing uh, field as well. Because whether you like that notion or not, you're actually asking people to pay money for something. Not for, for your own profit, but still give their money for, for something. Da, i ne možete više da zovete samo ljude da se priključe u akciju, nego morate da smislite neki drugi način, kao što sam ja napravio sportski bazar koji je zamišljen tako da to bude kao pijaca, dakle kao buvljak, ali na koji vam poznate ličnosti za štandovima pro, uh, prodaju stvari. Tako da vi od futbalera, glumaca ili pisaca možete da lično kupite njihove stvari i da sa njima se oko cene ove, 
cenkati, tako da je ono što je potrebno danas jesu i neke inovacije, opet kažem, na žalost, jer više ne možete da pokrenete ljude samo kad im kažete da je nekome pomoć potrebna, nego morate da smislite neki inovativni način da uredite to. So it's uh, it's not enough to uh, to ask uh, for help because help is needed. Uh, you have to get creative uh, today to uh, to alarm people to pay attention to you and eventually uh, join join the cause. One of these actions that uh, that I was doing is um, also creating so-called sport bazaar, which is like a marketplace where famous people, actors, uh, uh, sports people are uh, are behind. Um, uh, but behind the desk and you as uh, uh, as a buyer can uh, bargain with them uh, for a certain item and then along the line uh, uh, you, what you pay is actually going to humanitarian causes. A tako da u principu to je nešto ću ja da nastavim da radim, da pokušam da neki kreativni i drugačiji način pokušam da animiram ljude da se uključu u neke akcije. Eto. So this is basically what I will continue doing, uh, continue humanitarian work and continue trying to uh, find uh, more creative solutions uh, that, will, that will help that cause. Yeah, so my case is a bit different than uh, the startup uh, because of a corporate nature of the work. Um, having ten, over 350,000 employees around the world, um, we have a key point. Um, in order to pursue the, uh, the client engagement, so one word is engagement here. So how would we keep all the global clients uh, happy all the time? Uh, we have a strategy, basically. Uh, we try to first start from the users, so it's an inside-out approach. Uh, we found out that we can be the first testers or any of any technology that we would like to implement. And um, basically, the, the employees themselves became the testers of the IBM technology. Uh, it's not an easy task because you have a lot of people saying, why should I do that? Or it's the right thing for me. Uh, but we can have a very good proof of concept uh, with that. We started um, different technologies, uh, and different software uh, that we're now using and that clients are buying uh, just from the internal part. Uh, more important, most important is that uh, we try to have an ecosystem of startups so that they stay within IBM. So IBM invests in, in them, they let them to use the technology. So one day they will basically generate revenue for the company. So it's kind of a win, win-win solution for both of them. Uh, but the key point is the engagement. If you're able to keep the user engagement within your company, your customers will see that. So they will, uh, they will be more, most likely to buy your, uh, your product because there is some normal human who already used it. So the first customers are the users, so the employees. Thank you. Okay, and last one is myself. Uh, so what we are doing is creating platforms and we would like to create innovative platforms with technologies. And what we want to reach is by expressing yourself as a citizen on those platforms is to meet your own community. That means that you can reconnect with your own people first. And finally, we would like to make partnership with public institution. So in this case, the public institution can use our own data, so the opinion of people, to reach the best solution, politically speaking. And finally, um, we would like to um, spread the idea all over, all over the world. It's actually happening. We are in nine countries at the moment. And yeah, it's like the, all users, not users, but like we work for the citizens. And I realized that no matter where you come from, I'm French and I'm studying in Budapest and I created an association. And I mean, no matter where you come from, no matter which language you speak, you always find common um, aspect with people, common goal, common vision. And it's what we are doing. We want to uh, represent all of the citizens. And by technologies, we attract way more citizens than expected. So th thank you for everybody for your intention. And I hope you liked it. I think it's time for question. Uh, I don't know if any of you wants to. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any of you? Ah, okay. Give that, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
my question is uh, how to make uh, our data uh, as safe as uh, possible because we uh, talked about uh, security on the internet and uh, generally Mr. Far from ABM talked about data and how to make them secure. That's a question for you. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Who gets them? And then, okay, let's discuss it. So that's, that's a very important point. And there is no system that cannot be hacked because systems are created by humans. So we can put boundaries, we can put uh, firewalls, whatever we want, but there is no system that is like 100% proofed. So we need to know that. And that's one of the implications of anything that we build it can be IBM, can be Google, can be anything. Actually, Google has a price. If you're able to hack the system, you get, I don't know, $20,000 because you're help, helping them to find a bug. Uh, so the, the security and privacy are two uh, phases of the same coin. Uh, you cannot have the other one uh, without one of them. So it's, like, it's really, like really, really crucial point when building anything. Uh, so the future systems, we really need to first consider security and privacy because you as a user will have uh, uh, totally different, um, I mean the system will have totally different information about yourself. Uh, Facebook has also your sentiment analytics. Uh, so Facebook knows what time you're logging in, how do you feel, what things you like. So maybe knows more things about you that you do about yourself. Uh, so if you embed that with uh, uh, healthcare data, with uh, positioning data, uh, you can really get a profile of yourself. That really implies a lot of security and privacy. And nowadays, we don't have that much level of security, and talking generally, because um, we just, you know, I accept the terms very easily just to use the service, uh, but it should get more conscious. I think Apple has a very good uh, policy on that. Uh, we have seen all these uh, cases with police when people had to check the phones and it was blocked, so not even FBI could, could unlock it. So it's very strict policy. Uh, but it's definitely a concept that companies need to consider first when they're going to develop any of, of the technology. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You can, uh, you can pass by, you can pass by to in the back. <laughs> uh, just a second. Uh, thank you. Uh, what's your opinion on the net neutrality and recent text in the U.S. and laws about that? Net neutrality. And um, basically, U.S. government wants to control the traffic and see all the information on the Internet. And uh, there were, have been proposed recent laws which were dismissed, but uh, every now and then there's, a, a, again, it repeats. Well, if I understand it right, actually, uh, you, as soon as you're in the web, you, you have an information about yourself, so you're traceable. Yeah. Unless you're going into the deep web, then you leave information about yourself just with your IP, and your IP can leave something about, about yourself. And it can be a story behind that. Uh, the, if you're asking me about the agreement, that's how things go. Like, I know word about the how US government is acting, but actually they did it in terms of uh, legal because they wanted to know more about what happened in that case, for example, of the terrorist attack in California. And uh, I mean, from the, right, uh, from the legal side, it's very important that uh, there are proceedings about that. But of course, I understand also the corp corporate police for, for police, uh, policy of Apple uh, trying to protect the customer. Yeah. So that's a huge implication. Maybe we never seen something like that before. So as every um, political uh, problem, uh, there is like use case that is generated and analyzed over the time. And uh, there is not easy question to that actually. Uh, sorry, even easy answer to that. Uh, you, you can see like there are still a lot of proceedings on, uh, on this kind of uh, security and privacy issues. And, and it's funny to see how the technology is becoming also with, with a very, okay, we have the financial part, which is very big, but also now the legal parts uh, are covering the biggest part of, of the technology. So we're gonna see more and more, especially for the user data protection and uh, for the security of the user itself. Thank you. you wanna, yeah. yeah, so also building up on your question, uh, when was the last time you didn't install the app 
on your phone because of terms and conditions? No. <laughs> Never, right? Because we, we, you know, we, we accepted this. And just, uh, just think about this. Uh, th this whole thing is a technology is so young that uh, a lot of these companies that provide any kind of services are going to die out. So what's going to happen with all the data they, they have? I'm not afraid that Facebook or Google will misuse the data because they live of our data. If they leak uh, our user data, they will basically lose the value that they charge and earn those billions and billions and billions so that they can buy all these nice houses and stuff. So we have to keep supporting them that they you know, enjoy wealth. But um, uh, all, all of these things, they cannot, they cannot be controllable. Uh, when you use your phone, uh, let's just put aside what you're using, uh, w what you're browsing and stuff like that. And uh, uh, your favorite uh, uh, adult, uh, you know, websites. But, uh, y you know, with the usage of phone, you can actually uh, hack into a lot of uh, uh, health data. Because you're, there, there are publications on that, that your habits, like uh, your, the frequency of, of using your mobile phone, uh, really tells uh, if you're stressed if you're depressed, if you're whatever. So, and then uh, the major concern is that uh, it's actually financial because uh, your company boss should not be able under any circumstances to access any medical thing on you. And that is the, that is the thing I, I'm afraid of. I, I don't know if it's going to be even possible. When you type on keyboard, uh, the, the the mild uh, discrepancies between your typing habits uh, can actually uh, tell that you are about to get Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease to develop it in five years just by typing. So you are not aware, you don't feel any s symptoms, anything. I, d I don't think actually the, we are in the age of security and I don't think this is going to improve significantly. Sorry, where, where is the micro? The last one, okay. Else? Yeah, where is the... <laughs> uh, where is the next question? There, okay. Can someone make an action, like group action? Jump and throw it away. Does they work or? <laughs> no question anymore. I think it's first row actually. Uh, so my next question is: What will happen if Mark Zuckerberg uh, decide to delete Facebook? What will happen with the data? <laughs> yeah, that's actually, actually uh, so I don't know how likely it is for Facebook, but for other apps, they fail for, uh, for other reasons, and there is your data. And I'm betting that uh, there is a marketplace of, uh, of uh, personal data out there where somebody will just, you know, one day call you anonymously and say, look, I know what you did last summer <laughs> and blackmail you. I, I really believe that uh, this type of crime will start appearing. Any other question? Okay, so one question over there? No? Okay, just to move ahead, sorry. Um, okay, so I think we're done here. Um, can we... Uh, ah, okay. Question here? Ah, it's good.
my case, um, I studied a little bit about data so far, and I've seen that most of companies try to make profits of it. And I realized that uh, in my association, we don't want to make it profitable, but we want to make it valuable. Valuable for us because we, by collecting data, which is the opinion of people, we are trying to uh, improve ourselves, to make the data more valuable itself. Uh, we are trying also to make it valuable for the people, so they can like share uh, the interviews on Facebook, they can be proud of what they are saying. And we also make it valuable um, for the international sphere, so we all try to attract other countries to get to know Hungary, which is a country that nobody talks about a lot, actually. So I think is uh, the data itself and the emotion behind it, instead of being like looking for money or profits, it's all about value and um, the emotion you have behind it, all of the work around it. For me, it's my opinion. Yes, so for me, the human factor plays the primary role, um, especially based on my, my experience when I saw myself working for um, uh, the English market, um, so the UKI market. Um, I've been on the phone like all day and not even video conferencing, but it was just very cold job. So you never met your business partners, but you were talking to them every day. And then I changed the job and I've been in contact with the people in the center. So I've been meeting each and every person. So that totally changed the way of working uh, because I call it like from switching from radio to television uh, because it let me to you know, interact with people and be also more visible. The human factor is one of the most important points because uh, you can really make decisions only if you maybe see this, the person. You can have data, uh, you can have um, tons of data, tons of nice um, reports and uh, pivot tables telling you what uh, the situation of the company is. But as soon as you don't meet a person, it can be an interview, can be a project you need to have a person for, or anything. You can build up a team. You cannot build up a team uh, from data that you get from a report. You need to meet the team. You need to go for a beer. And you need to have some chemistry together in order to succeed and, have, and share the vision together. So uh, in my experience, the human factor has been playing a primary role. Even with uh, uh, what they called low-skilled people, uh, that were not maybe able to perform the job according to numbers, but who found very good motivation once they were in the project. So, and they were interacting with others. So uh, maybe individually they were not really very good uh, in terms of skills, but in the team they found their place. So in the team they found a way how to succeed. So that's about my experience. Thank you. And Okay, pa dobro, pošto se bavim humanitarnim radom, logično je, mada u neku ruku možda i nije, jer vidimo šta se sve radi na tom polju, ali u principu sve što radite morate da radite sa emocijom i sa nekom dozom, ne znam koji je reč za to, ali morate da budete iskreni i emotivni, onda kad ljudi to prepoznaju, oni će da se priključe i to je ono što je najbitnije, tako da nisam kao vi za računarima pa da je to onako nešto, ali to se u humanitarnom radu otprilike podrazume. So in humanitarian work it almost goes without saying that it's about emotions and that you have to have sincere emotions and be with people, people will then understand it and then there is the, the connection is made is made this way and not like us computer geeks so we have to uh, think about it but in humanitarian work it's it's practically the, the very reason behind uh, behind it that was his part now my part is uh, that I, I I think we are humans at the end of the day and uh, this is very this is the essence of it I mean we we often forget about it, but we are here on this planet for a very short time to have a good time, you know, and and go good emotions and not, you know, overwork ourselves or whatever. This is not the point. The point is to enjoy. 
and you know, and and also from from uh, a cognitive perspective, you know that that there are specific uh, types of neural cells in the frontal cortex that you know just go on when you are in presence of people. So biologically, we were made we were made to be with other people, and uh, this is. Uh, this is the the point. Like you know, of course, we in in business relations, you will also s hear a lot of time times. Uh, you know, you should not be emotional. Be make rational choices, which is true up to a, a, a you know up to a moment. But uh, at the end of the day, the uh, people who made it, who are successful, had a big dr and uh, had their drive, and this drive was emotional. So th this is. Uh, you know, this is what ma made it uh, happen. So, we are paying too little t uh, time for it, and I think it's it's a very crucial thing. If somebody doesn't like you, you cannot work with him. No matter, very rarely, the, you know, the business interest can materialize if you are, you know, don't have good chemistry. What you said also, uh, I heard from a, a friend in HR. He said, "I'm not reading. Uh, you know, I'm." trying not to read CVs so much anymore because it's a waste of time. You know, for me, it's way better to just, you know, invite everybody and see how we, you know, how we click because CVs are so, so uh, you know, so pumped up. You cannot read a person through CV anymore. <laughs>